Welcome everyone to our Ask a Neurologist interview. This time we are joined by Dr. Patrick Kwan, who is a clinician and neurologist at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne, Australia, and also a researcher at Monash University. Patrick, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Patrick, today we are here specifically to talk about an area of your special interest, which is drug-resistant epilepsy, or what's often referred to as DRE, drug-resistant epilepsy. Can you start out by telling us just generally what, what is drug-resistant epilepsy or when is epilepsy considered to be drug-resistant? Mm, that's a very good question. Um, generally speaking, uh, well first maybe take a step back, why do we need a definition? Why do we need to recognise someone's epilepsy as being drug-resistant? Um, and uh, this is because there are many um, all sorts of implications, you know, when we recognize the epilepsy to be drug resistant because it may mean that we should look at non-drug options, you know, treatments that don't involve medications. Mm -hmm. It will also um, mean that perhaps there, there would be a need for a greater support for the, for the patient uh, and other needs, you know, social needs, educational needs and um, for research purposes, uh, that when we are developing new therapies, new treatments, mm -hmm. then we want to make sure we are targeting the right group of patients you know, by different researchers at different centers around the world. So mm -hmm. that's why uh, it, has been, it has a major implication impact when we recognize an epilepsy to be drug resistant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've heard, and I'm sure many others have as well in our audience today, have heard that around 30% or a third of people who suffer from epilepsy actually have drug resistant epilepsy. Is that an accurate figure in your experience? That is a very more or less that's the case. And that's built on a lot of research that have been done for the last um, decades and involving, including some of the research you know, we've been involved in, which shows very clearly if you were to follow someone up at the beginning when they start their journey of starting having taken medications over the years there is a group of patients about 30 percent who no matter how many drugs you try uh, their epilepsy is still not controlled and they still have seizures that's a lot of mm. people around mm. the world isn't it, it so is, we're yeah. talking in, in the 20 to 30 million category of people Possibly, if you looked at the total epilepsy population, usually mm -hmm. put around 30, 70 million patient mm -hmm. people. And um, the other uh, important um, you know, factor is that give, despite we have had many new drugs being developed in the last 10 to 15 years, this percentage, this 30% hasn't changed. Wow, so it, despite there being new mm -hmm. medications mm -hmm. available, yeah. there's still this large proportion of people who are resistant to those medications right. yeah. and still suffer seizures. That's right. So this relates to a question mm. that was submitted mm. by one of our uh, cheeky friends, Submit. Mm. He was submitted a question on Twitter and he was asking if epilepsy can be considered to be re drug resistant mm. if someone is currently taking medication but still experiences auras or seizures but to a lesser degree. Is that drug resistant epilepsy? Um, we would still consider, consider that drug resistant right. and based on the reason that you know, even the auras or so-called little seizures, they can still have huge impact you know, mm -hmm. on someone's ability to learn, to go to school, to uh, drive a car for instance, to take up jobs uh, and so to be completely seizure free is what we aim for. Mm -hmm. so, you asked earlier how or when can we recognize epilepsy being drug resistant and it's based on the observation that once someone has failed two medications their chance of responding to more than medications uh, is greatly de diminished. Right, so after two medications have been unsuccessful then it is unlikely or much less likely that any further medications will make a difference or will That's correct. get yeah. seizure so freedom not, for a person. Yeah, so we're not saying mm. impossible, but mm. that's the time when we say the epilepsy is, res it is resistant to drugs. Right. Um, it means that even if you try the third, fourth, fifth, there may still be a chance of responding, but there's something different about this epilepsy in this particular right. individual. Right. Because we know, you know 60% or more people will respond to the first and second drug. So right. for those who don't, then there's something unusual, something is a reflex being raised. Mm -hmm. So at that point, by recognizing this, it should prompt 
um, actions, you know, such as um, referral to a specialist center for evaluation, making sure we've got the right diagnosis, the right classification of the epilepsy, and also start thinking about other forms of treatment that are not drugs. It doesn't mean you stop the drugs, doesn't mean you stop yeah. trying the drugs, but it means you need to start considering start exploring. Start exploring, exactly. Right, right. Well, Sumit, I hope that answers mm -hmm. your question. Thank you for submitting your question. Patrick, our next question was also submitted via Twitter, thanks to our cheeky friends all over the world. And this question was submitted by Jen. Jen asks, if epilepsy medications aren't working, the more traditional AEDs, anti-epileptic drugs, could it be possible that seizures would be generated by a psychological or a psychogenic mechanism? Can that happen? Um. Psychogenic seizures and epileptic seizures are very different. They right. For different um, reasons, different biology, if you, if that's the um, understandable term, it means mm -hmm. different things are happening in your brain. So right. They are treated and managed to be differently. But having said that, um, psychological factors, you know, especially stress, anxiety, they can make seizures worse. Mm. So they can act as a contributing factor. So right. we do, in someone who's got poorly controlled epilepsy, we do consider whether there are psychological factors that could be impacting on their response to treatment. Stress, psychological stress and anxiety can um, act as a exacerbating factor, can yeah. precipitate and, seizures. And many people who experience seizures mm. do experience things like anxiety and stress as a direct result mm. of their seizures and, and, yes, and yeah. The, yeah. the everyday stress Absolutely. that that puts them under. So that's a bit of a self-perpetuating mechanism, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. So you know, research done all over the world, including by us, have shown a third of people with epilepsy have anxiety mm -hmm. and about roughly the same proportion have depression. Yeah. So it's a very, um, it's really, uh, see, means that epilepsy is not just about seizures. We need to look at other coexisting um, problems and psychological uh, mental health is mm. increasingly recognized uh, uh, and that requires um, proper management. Yeah, oh, look, you're preaching to the mm. choir here. Mm. I absolutely mm. think that mm. we need to look at the holistic view of, mm. of epilepsy mm. and yeah. how it affects yeah. people in, in so many That's different ways. Thank you for that question, Jen. Our next question comes from Emma. This was submitted via Instagram. Thank you, Emma. And Emma asks about the different types of seizures. So there are lots of different types of seizures that someone with epilepsy could be experiencing. Mm. Some people will experience mm. more than one. Mm. Is there a particular type or types of seizures that are less resistant or mm. more resistant mm. to medication? Mm. It's a very good question. Very clever. It must be coming from, coming from someone very smart. Of course, they <laughs> are taking your own friend. <laughs> <laughs> like this. And uh, the answer is yes, of course, there are. Uh, lots of different types of seizures and some medications um, work better for some or put it the other way around some seizures respond to some other types of medications uh, but more importantly perhaps is that some medications can make certain seizures worse right so that's something oh, that's interesting. sometimes not well um, not 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 well recognized right so some some a kind of mm. standard frontline mm. anti-epileptic drugs could in fact worsen some types of seizures. Mm, that's right. Yeah. Wow, I didn't yeah, know that. That's right. And that's because different types of seizures, they have again different mechanisms and what mm. happens in the brain and the drugs, they do different things. So it's not surprising perhaps, but right. then it's not something that again, not well discussed and not well recognized. Mm -hmm. And so that goes back to why is it so important to make sure uh, we've got the correct type of seizures classified that we right. know what type of seizures the pay, um, for someone's having because uh, we, we need that information in order to yes. use the best and most appropriate medications Absolutely. yeah and that's right. why when you see your doctors they would ask you what happens in a seizure um, and what do other people see maybe ask your parents other witnesses mm. who've seen the seizures you know what what happens in a seizure and that's because all these can help us decide what type of seizures um, someone's doing. having yeah. and also having an EEG which you have, may have had with wires in your head they can also help us by looking at the brain wave activities uh, in a seizure and between seizures they can also give us clues as to what type of seizure someone will be having so they're not right. they're being done with um, uh, not just because we want to stick 
things on your head, but because they do provide <laughs> great hairstyles. <laughs> <that gives> you... <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> we have the electrical colors to match. Yeah, <laughs> the hair color, uh, but also because they they give a lot of information. Yes. That's that's um, really important. And you mentioned that you can get information not just from looking at EEGs mm. during the seizure, but also during that interictal period between seizures. Yeah. That also gives that's you information. Right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. So that's, so, so that's why people yeah. might have EEGs for 24 or 36 hours and the recording the whole time is relevant, not just that seizure period. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's really interesting. Yes. Yeah. So very important mm. to make sure that you've had that kind of... Um, um, recording done in order to get the best chance at getting the right medication for your seizures. Thank you for that question, Emma. Our next question was submitted by Punita on Facebook, and I'm sorry if I haven't pronounced that correctly. Punita asks, why do epilepsy medications sometimes stop working? Can epilepsy become drug resistant when it wasn't to start with? Another brilliant question. Um, again, something that is very close to our heart. We've been doing a lot of research, trying to understand this um, phenomenon. You know, mm -hmm. what happens to patients when someone starts taking medication? What kind of patterns and how do they respond to drugs? And what we found is that um, about a third of patients respond very well. When you start right. the medications, they become seizure-free and they stay seizure-free on that medication. Right. You have on another, a single on the sing, sometimes single, sometimes two medic, uh, some of the single medications. Yeah, and then there's another twenty percent or so will uh, take a bit longer, maybe more than six months to a year, to get seizure free. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's a bit of trial and error finding the right drug. But once they do, they stay seizure free. They're controlled. Right. The drugs they don't, they still work. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have, but then you have about one in six people mm -hmm. in their epilepsy, it will fluctuate. So right. sometimes respond to medications, seizure free for long, sometimes long periods for years, and mm -hmm. then they have a relapse. They, another seizure will break through. They have some seizures right. lasting for whilst on the same while on the same medications, right. and then they will go back to become seizure free again, mm -hmm. and they go back and forth, fluctuating like a ping pong, yo 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 mm -hmm. in between having seizures and seizures under control, even with the same medications. Right. And that's, um, again, something not very well recognized in the past, but we do see this in about one in six people. And that leaves about a quarter of people, those who have the, the hardcore drug resistant. Mm -hmm. No matter how many drugs you try, they never become seizure free. Right. So there are different patterns of how people respond um, to medications. And if someone was taking a medication that had worked for them in the past, and then started to have seizures again, would do you, as a clinician, would you change that medication or add to it or see what happens? What what kind of um, clinical path would that person mm. be looking at? Well, first we will look at whether there are any other factors, any, other, any reasons, external reasons right. that could explain why suddenly someone has a seizure after a long period of having control. Yeah, a sudden know, change of health, for example. Change of health and change of, uh, we've discussed mental, uh, mental health, you know, yep. stress, anxiety, psychological health, but mm -hmm. also any chance of accidental missing medications or you know, any other factors to yep. start with. Um, and then we would then have to consider would anything have, has changed? Our brain is constantly evolving, constantly changing. Mm -hmm. um, and so your doctor may uh, decide it may be a good idea uh, to have another uh, more test done like mm -hmm. another EEG or another brain scan just to make sure nothing new has happened and then after we've done all that we would then this you know have to um, consider whether you know, should we wait and see could this be a one-off or are we seeing a really a deterioration in which case you may need to change your medications etc so right. it's not a, uh, a knee-jerk reaction to yep. increase Med drugs and drugs and drugs. Thank you for that question, Punita. Now, our next question is a big question. This was submitted in a couple of different forms by multiple people. Dr. Kwan, we're talking about drug resistant epilepsy. What non pharmaceutical options are available if someone has drug resistant epilepsy? Does it always involve surgery? Is there other things that people can do? 
to try to achieve seizure freedom if the drugs mm, don't work? Mm, mm. It is a very big question. Big one. And I'll give you a big answer. <laughs> okay, that's what we like. It's an N O N O. And uh, as a big answer, if you like, there are uh, different types of treatments other than surgery. Surgery is still obviously a uh, key um, po uh, potential option. Yep. Other options, uh, broadly speaking, you know, would involve um, some kind of diet, mm -hmm. which we can go into details of any of these. So surgery, diet, devices. Devices. And uh, psychological uh, behavioral therapy, as uh -huh. we just discussed, you know, mm -hmm. because psychological factor can um, contribute to seizures. So right. broadly speaking, there are these um, several types of treatments. Okay, well let's start with talking about surgery. Mm. Um, so I have personally met a number of people who've had successful um, neurosurgery to achieve seizure control, reduction or complete seizure mm. freedom. Mm. How do doctors determine the potential for success mm. in mm. the case of things like brain surgery, temporal lobectomies, things like that. How do you know that it'll work? And this is related to a question asked by Gemma through our Facebook page. So thank you, Gemma, for that. So indeed, it's, not, it's a very, involves a quite extensive um, uh, testing, you know, mm -hmm. doing a number of testing. You can imagine operation on the brain is not taking your appendix out. Mm. No, no, no offense to the no offense to the appendix. <laughs> no, of appendix to, no offense to any appendix <laughs> surgeons very, out there. Don't get upset. <laughs> but uh, it does involve a few more uh, testing, mm. and uh, in the simple terms, you want to we the test we do want to answer two questions. So again, the tests are not done just for you know we want to put you through all the scans and the the tenth scan you may have need mm -hmm. to go through. But the aim to answer two questions. One is where are the seizures coming from? Where right. is the focus? The focus, the, the, the focus of the seizure, where, the, the where they start. Where they start, where yeah. they come from, coming from. Mm -hmm. Because we know that without knowing that, we can't, we don't know where, what to take out yep. in the surgery. But the second question is equally important is, is it safe to take it out? Mm -hmm. So can we take it out without causing um, um, deficit or without affecting the normal function of that part of the brain? So all mm -hmm. the tests, we need, we need to answer these two questions and until your doctors are happy that these two questions are answered, then um, they will not rec be able to recommend an operation. Right. And obviously, this is a uh, we need to uh, involve the, uh, the the person to discuss all this potential risk and benefit of the surgery. Mm -hmm. But all the tests we do, are trying to answer uh, how do we decide whether someone to go ahead with operation, what type of operation would depend on the answers to mm -hmm. these two questions. Yeah, yeah. And this involves a, a, an entire team of clinicians from different backgrounds, doesn't yes. it? It involves yeah. not just mm. your neurologist or epileptologist, mm. but the neurosurgeon, the general practitioners, the nursing staff, everyone's yes, involved yeah. in the this. The radiologist, the mm -hmm. neuropsychiatrist. Yeah. Yep. If you mm. want to know more about epilepsy surgery, folks, then you can actually check out our interview with Dr. Sasha Dionisio, who was um, head of the epilepsy advanced epilepsy unit at the Mater Hospital in Queensland. You'll find that interview on our website. He's a good friend. So, Dr. Kwan, that's that's the surgery path. What about other paths? You mentioned devices. What mm. what devices are available? I mean, are we talking like an Apple mm. Watch or? Uh, not quite yet, but okay. we're, going, we're <laughs> heading there. But devices are devices that uh, that um, uh, delivers electrical stimulation to the brain or to nerves. Oh right, yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. So. You may have heard of a vagus nerve stimulator, yep. which um, is uh, put under the, under the skin, your chest wall with a wire uh, thread under the skin mm -hmm. uh, to stimulate uh, a nerve in, in your neck, mm -hmm. uh, which then um, uh, would then the signals would be transmitted to different parts of the brain to reduce seizures. Right. So it's not as a not as not a brain surgery. Um, per se, mm -hmm. uh, but it is uh, a procedure that needs to be done under general anaesthetic. Right, right, but not yeah. not, not a mm. brain surgery, but mm. still a mm. surgery. It's still of, surgery yeah. type. There mm -hmm. are other stimulators now being used that are more used um, in countries outside Australia, right. um, such as a brain, brain, a deep brain stimulator with right. electrodes actually going inside the brain. So this is deep brain stimulation. Mm. Is that similar to the deep brain stimulation done in... Uh, say Parkinson's disease? 
similar in terms of the hardware, but right. different um, parts of the brain would be stimulated. Right. Stimulating okay. different parts of the brain um, right. and for different reasons. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that you mentioned in terms of options, well, you mentioned two mm. other things, mm. was um, diet mm. and also um, dealing with psychology mm. and mental health issues mm. that might be exacerbating seizures. Mm. So can we talk briefly about those? How yeah. does diet affect your seizures? Yeah, sure. Um, diet is a, again, a, a one of, perhaps some people argue is one of the oldest treatment for seizures, mm -hmm. uh, going back to biblical time when uh, people were instructed to fast. Yes. Um, that causes changes in your biochemistry, in your body, uh, and in the brain as well, mm -hmm. uh, which and we know that changes in the uh, biochemistry, the acidity, and going back to your science lessons, can affect how the brain cells work. Right. Mm -hmm. So they can affect the chicken neurons, make them less cheeky or more mm -hmm. cheeky. So, so that's the reason for why diet can work. Mm -hmm. uh, the different types of diet, um, and um, there's a lot of research showing that they can help mm. in people who. Uh, don't respond to medications in both right. children and in adults. In adults. So we're talking about things like the ketogenic diet, mm -hmm. um, which has been shown, I understand, in particularly in children who don't respond to medications to be That's quite right. effective for That's seizure correct. control. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's, the ketogenic diet is quite a restrictive diet. Yes. Um, difficult to stick to, so well done if you are sticking uh, taking <laughs> it. Uh, for adults, for grown-ups, uh, we are usually a bit more naughty. So. Uh, for grown-ups, we tend to use what is called the modified Atkins diet. Modified Atkins diet, yeah, yeah, right. With Atkins was based on the ketogenic diet to start with, I understand, wasn't it? Uh, Atkins was, uh, at least in the, in, the popular, uh, in, the, in the popular use, was more for uh, weight loss yep. and losing weight. Uh, for the epilepsy uh, seizure control, we use a modified form. Right. Uh, and, but don't forget, you know, the going to diet is not something that is easy for someone to just do by him or herself. Yes. Um, you have to have a dietitian to support mm -hmm. you and discuss with your doctors, making sure there are no uh, reasons and no, it won't cause any problems because yeah. there are certain conditions pe pe uh, that uh, diets, these kind of diets will not be recommended. Recommended or yes. suitable for, yeah. yeah. So mm. always in, in any situation, please talk to your personal clinicians about any of the things we're talking about today. So the last thing you mentioned in terms of alternatives to medication was um, cognitive behavioural therapy. And we talked at the start of this interview about the fact that um, stress and anxiety mm. can certainly exacerbate mm. seizures. So mm. talk to me about how that all ties together in a, as an alternative or maybe as an adjunct or an additional therapy to mm. medications. Mm. I think looking at it like, as a adjunctive is, is the best way to look at these um, more psychological or cognitive behavioral right. uh, treatments. There are now good evidence that some types can work. It's an area that is difficult to do research you know, for mm. uh, many reasons, but there is now good uh, evidence showing certain kinds of behavioral therapy uh, would work, uh, can work well, uh, and the lowering the stress or, uh, uh, and a level in general uh, can lower the seizure threshold as we've just uh, mm -hmm. talked about earlier on as well. Yeah. And for one particular type it's called the mindfulness-based therapy, mm -hmm. which is derived from the Buddhist Zen teaching, I yep. believe, and we've done some work showing that it can help um, uh, improving uh, cognitive function, quality of life, and even seizure control. So right. um, talk to, a, uh, you know, uh, taking, looking after your mental health, you know, psychological health is very, very important. Very, very important for everyone, but especially someone suffering from epilepsy or any other neurological condition. Um, look after your mind, look after your brain, look after your body. They all tie in together. Dr. Kwan, that's all the questions that we had today. So I'd like to thank you so much on behalf of Cheeky Neurons friends from around the world for joining us and for answering some of our questions about drug resistant epilepsy. We do have a small thank you gift for Dr. Kwan today which comes, as you might guess, in the form of his very own cheeky neuron. Dr. Kwan, please accept this cheeky neuron and thank you so much for answering our questions today. If you do have more questions about drug-resistant epilepsy or if anything in this interview has raised questions for you about your own experience, please 
take those questions to your clinician and talk to your clinician, your neurologist and your doctor um, about any questions, any further questions you might have. Hopefully we've been able to give some answers to you today and thank you again Dr. Kwan for participating. Thank you very much.